You know, looking around on water cooling forums and stuff, uh, I belong to a few water cooling enthusiast groups. I kind of see something that people tend to repeat a lot and it's not entirely true. And that is gonna be that your water pump should always be set to 100%. And today we actually tested how the effects of temperature and pump speed relation uh, affect each other with 50%, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100% to see whether or not you should be setting your pump to 100% fan speed in the BIOS. I'm gonna tell you right now, the results are actually a little different than I expected. So stay tuned because I, there's some interesting data in this one and it might help you guys out if you're trying to figure out how to set up your systems and your water cooling loops, whether it be AIO or a custom open water loop. And uh, I, I think this one's gonna be kind of interesting. For those looking for a high-end custom gaming experience, look no further than Falcon Northwest. Falcon Northwest has been building PCs made for gamers for over 30 years with a focus on a true high-end gaming experience. Custom cases available only through Falcon Northwest feature state-of-the-art testing and design to ensure that every component is performing at their best through thermal imaging and rigorous lab testing designed and overseen by the Falcon Northwest founder himself. With a complete lineup of systems ranging from small to large, every Falcon Northwest system includes a three-year warranty policy and a year of two-way overnight shipping coverage providing the ultimate peace of mind. To see all that Falcon Northwest has to offer, follow the sponsored link in the description below. You know, I often see people comparing automotive when they talk about uh, water pumps and loops and all that sort of stuff. You, you can't really, first of all, I just want to throw this out there. You can't compare an automotive, an automotive water loop or automotive loop, eh? You can't compare an automotive water loop to something like a CPU water loop, okay? The, first of all, you were talking about massive differences in temperatures that you're having to deal with. For instance, an engine is designed to run at like 215 to 225 degrees Fahrenheit on the coolant, whatever that works out to in Celsius. And the water is running through engine heads in an engine block, which is getting to hundreds and hundreds of degrees. Sometimes uh, even, you know, with five, 600 degrees as they go through the cylinder head. So we are talking about a massive amount of temperature differential between fluid and the part it's touching. When it comes to water loops, I mean, we're talking about a CPU that might be putting out 80C to 90C, depending on the CPU. And we're talking about coolant temperature that runs somewhere in the high 20s to low 30C. We're talking about a 60C delta at the most. So you, you can't compare the two. The other thing is the whole reason why a thermostat exists in a water cooling system for a car is so that you don't overcool the engine. And that has everything to do with emissions. So the, cool, the colder an engine runs and the colder the cylinder temperature heads are, uh, you don't typically get as efficient of a burn of the fuel. So you end up getting a lot of excess fuel in the exhaust, which means you're polluting more. So yes, I know modern engines and such have become much more efficient in that manner in terms of uh, EGRs and recycling the gases to make sure they get burned off and they're not polluting more. But I'm only stating these to say, Stop comparing them. You cannot compare them whatsoever. Most of the time, if you take the thermostat out of, a, of, out of an engine and just let the coolant free loop uh, or free flow, oftentimes the engine overcools and gets extremely cold. Sometimes, depending on the engine, it might actually overheat. So there's just too many variables in the application to determine whether or not uh, you can even compare the two. So stop doing that. But the myth that we're gonna talk about today is the fact that you should be running your pump speeds at 100%. Now, there's a few reasons for that. The idea here is that by moving the fluid as fast as you possibly can, you're gonna cool it down as fast as you possibly can. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that is, that, is a, that is a fable, that is a myth. It is not true when it comes to water cooling. There's several reasons for that. One, the faster that the fluid is moving through the component picking up heat, also means because there's no thermostat in here and it all moves at one speed, that coolant is spending less time in the radiator being cooled down as well. So it has everything to do with how many times is fresh coolant or cold coolant actually touching the component that you're trying to cool. Now on the flip side, one of the reasons why the radiator uh, thermostats exist in cars is so that you can hold the coolant in the radiator longer to cool it down more. So you get a higher delta of temperature between the cold coolant entering the engine versus the engine uh, or the temperature of the coolant entering the radiator. Doesn't apply to this. So again, only comparing to show you the differences and why people need to stop comparing what they know about automotive cooling loops versus CPU cooling loops. Uh, but there is a, a is kind of a sweet spot. So let's talk about the, some of the reasons why I say you shouldn't run your fan or your pump speeds at 100%. And then we'll jump into the data, which I guess kind of actually agrees with that. But anyway, by running your electronic thing, 
whether it be a fan or a pump or whatever at 100%, you are putting it into its fastest degradation cycle. Now, anything that has a motor or spins that has any sort of a copper coil or any sort of, of motor in it has a lifespan. And the higher you run that motor at its max voltage or wattage, the less lifespan you're gonna get out of it. Now, usually the way that lifespans are rated, in case you're not understanding this, when you look at like uh, literature for either a pump or a fan, when it says the life expectancy is, let's say 50,000 hours, that is how long it took for 50% of what's being tested to fail. So let's do this, let's, let's explain this a little bit more layman-like. I used to work in the lighting industry when it came to energy efficiency in the software that we ran. And we had to deal with lighting companies all the time when they talked about like life expectancy and life rating. That does not mean you're guaranteed to get 50,000 hours out of it. You could get less, you could get more. It's just how long it took for 50% of the test uh, subjects to fail. So let's say they were testing 10,000 of them. How long did it take for 5,000 of them to fail? And if, the, if that was 50,000 hours, that's how they rate it. It's always right in the middle, basically. So when we talk about that, the life expectancy of a pump, there's a million different things that can determine that. If you're running it at 100%, you are going to be on the lower end of that spectrum of how much time you're gonna get before it fails. If you're running it at a lower voltage, you're gonna extend the lifespan of it. It's just like degrading a CPU, only we're talking about motors in this instance. If you run them at a lower voltage, you're gonna get a longer lifespan out of them because they're not spending their entire life basically sprinting as fast as they possibly can. Now we're talking about the reasons why I say you should not run your pumps at 100% is because of the fact that usually you are not getting any better cooling situation out of it. You're just shortening the lifespan of your component. That's the reason why PWM exists and why things can speed up and slow down and have ebb and flow depending on the load that the component is going under. So if the CPU is just sitting there idling, doing nothing, or in this instance, running the best benchmark in the planet in the background, then it can ramp up based on its usage. And then when it's not being used, it can slow itself down, not only making it more efficient in terms of overall power draw for the system, but also overall lifespan when it comes to your, your motorized parts. Uh, so let's go and take a look at the chart right here. So I used my 9800X3D locked at 5.3 gigahertz fixed at 1.225 volts fixed with a 20C ambient temperature on a 360 EK AIO running at 100% fan speed. So what? that basically means is the only variable in these tests is the pump speed itself. Um, I also used OCCT. So I used it on the fixed amount of cores, which means it's gonna load up all 16 threads, no matter what, eight core, 16 threads. And it is on the um, normal uh, work set. It's not on the extreme. So first thing you might notice here is the 50% has a tiny little chart just because it failed. And the reason for that is we also have to take into account the temperature to stability when it comes to the CPU. So as we can see, based on locking the CPU at 5.3 gigahertz at 1.225 volts, it was not stable uh, above 90C. And you can see that it was actually climbing when it failed. And actually it validated the failure three times. It failed three times on me. So it wasn't like a, a one-off failure. That just has to do with the fact that since we fixed the CPU to these parameters, it could not auto adjust itself to stay stable. It just says sys full system lockup. So that's why uh, it does not have a chart that goes all the way across. Now, if we look at 60% pump speed and 70% pump speed, you can see uh, both of those start out just under, well, actually the 60% pump speed starts out just under 90. It just shoots up to just under 90, about 89.5 C. And then as you can see towards the end of the test, it had climbed above 90 C. If you look at the 70% pump speed, you can see the temperature started lower Actually, had some interesting dips in there, but anyway, it started lower, but as you can see, it met up with the 60% pump speed above 90C uh, for a little bit there and then normalized at just about 90C. Now, these are 15 minute tests. I need to point that out. Um, the AIO has hit equilibrium in that amount of time because AIOs have such a low volume of fluid. It does not take a long time to meet equilibrium. If you're doing this test and testing pump speed yourself uh, and you're doing this with an open loop and you have a big volume of coolant, you need to let it run probably at least 30, 45 minutes or more, depending on the volume of fluid. So if I was doing this with gold member, I probably have to let it run for an hour each time just because of how long it would take to reach that equilibrium. Otherwise, the charts would probably be very useless because they would never stop climbing, although very, very slowly. Now, here's the interesting part. If we look at 80, 90 and 100 percent pump speeds, that's the pink, yellow and blue lines. You can see they're all very, very close to each other right around that 87 C mark. Now you might be going 87 C. That's a lot. Remember, we are running the 
all core overclock at 5.3 locked at 1.225 volts, which is probably a little higher than I need it to be. But the point is here, we're pumping heat and that's the whole, the whole point of this test. So because it's kind of difficult to see what's happening here, I zoomed in the chart. So you'll notice it starts at 80 and ends at 95, which is a really weird, uh, it's only 15 degrees, but I zoomed it in that way we could see what's happening in more detail uh, as it goes across the 15 minutes. But as you can see, the 100% pump speed here in the light blue line starts lower than everything, but right about the middle of the test, it's about a half a degree hotter than 80% and 90%. And that's what I actually didn't expect. I didn't expect it to actually go higher right there. Um, if we look at the 90% pump speed, you can see it starts higher of the three when comparing 80, 90, and 100, but it actually stays under 100 in that middle hump and equalizes just within a couple of tenths of a degree right above the 100% fan speed. But what I did not expect is if you look at the 80% pump speed, as an average, it stays lower than both 90 and 100 across the middle, beginning and end of our test. Actually, it starts just above 100, just under 90, and in the middle of the test, it's the lowest of the three, and at the end of the test, it's the lowest of the three. So I was not expecting the 80% pump speed to be the best. I'll be honest, I was kind of expecting 70% to be the best, but look at what happens when you change. These are all 10% differences in pump speed. But if you, if you look at the difference between 80 and 70, it's pretty massive. I mean, everything's locked down in this room in terms of temperatures, everything's locked down in terms of the CPU test, and the CPU was allowed to cool down between every single test, starting the test uh, at just about 36 to 40 C, depending on what was maybe loading in the background before I started the test. They all started at the same temperature. So it's not like there was any heat soak or anything there. But as you can see, according to this chart, in this particular scenario, 80% pump speed would actually be our sweet spot. And that's actually good for the pump because you're not running it at 100%, which means we are not accelerating the amount of wear that the pump is exceed, ex, uh, experiencing, giving us a longer lifespan. So I have a theory as to why 100% might not be necessarily the best speed on here, is I have a feeling all AIOs have a little bit of air in there. And I have a feeling at 100%, it might've actually been cavitating ever so slightly. Now remember, our setup is set where the radiators are on their side, like this. Now I do have the tubes below the top rows of the radiator, so that any air that's caught in the system should have still been caught in the top rows. But if you are moving the coolant very quickly, as the coolant is passing by and making that turn, it could actually push some air with it and that air can make its way to the pump. I didn't, couldn't hear any pump air sloshing in there, but I have a theory that that's potentially what could be happening. We're 80% is the sweet spot where we were moving coolant and only coolant, and it was passing enough fluid through the radiator and over the hot component at a rate that was sufficient to keep it at the most efficient temperatures. Now we're talking a difference of, I mean, look, between the, the three 80, 90, and 100% pump speeds, we're talking a difference between 86 and 88C. They're very, very close. But the bottom line is that kind of proves the point. You don't need to run it at 100% because if we're getting just as good of a temperature and slightly lower at 80%, giving us 20% more headroom in terms of wear and tear on the pump, that's a good thing. That proves the whole, you don't have to run it at 100%. Now we're gonna go into an extreme case here where I'll probably have to do a follow-up video where I do this with an open loop because we now have to talk about open loops. There is a major difference between the pump and cold plate that you find in your AIO versus a standalone pump you tend to find in a water cooling loops like an open loop. So this happens to be a bike ski right here that has a D5 pump in it. The D5 on its absolute lowest setting, its starting voltage would move far more coolant probably in an order of magnitude, I would I would personally, like I should flow rate this and, and see if I'm right. I would guess the D5 on its lowest speed could move at least twice the amount of coolant that the AIO like Asetek design can at 100% uh, fan speed. So I wanna do this test again where we talk about like D5s and DDCs and on their speed settings, because it's one of the reasons why I also prefer when I do a custom loop, to use manual pumps and not PWM pumps like this, which actually use a motherboard to tell it to speed up and slow down. Because as I've showed right here, there's no reason to tell it to speed up and slow down. Now you might be able to argue and say, well, Jay, then if the CPU and everything's under a very low load, why wouldn't you want the pump to slow down to say 50% or 60% pump speed? That way you could save the pump uh, even further. That's kind of what we have to test here because we have to figure out where the lowest flow rate is that's acceptable to keep the loop moving. Now you're asking a lot of a pump 
to have to speed up and slow down, to have to overcome the amount of head pressure that you're gonna experience when you have tubing and fittings and blocks and all of that. So just that speeding up and slowing down and then speeding up against that head pressure could actually accelerate wear as well versus it doing its startup speed, which is almost always 100% and then it slows down and then keeping the loop moving at a constant rate. So that's something I wanna test. But the nice thing about it is I typically will find with the manual pumps, like using a screwdriver, where the sweet spot is, where the temperatures are great, uh, but it's not making a loud hum because D5s definitely like to hum and there's a resonance point in every spinning device, whether it be a fan or a motor or a pump, there's gonna be a, a resonance point where it'll be its loudest because of the environment that it's in, it's vibrating and causing sound to vibrate through the entire loop itself. So I tend to just do it by hand. It's like, think of me as an old carburetor tuner when it comes to water cooling. I don't like using PWM and smart pumps. That's why I haven't used this guy yet. I will probably someday somewhere. But uh, I thought that this was an interesting topic to talk about because I still see people all the time uh, incorrectly stating things like, oh, you should run your pump at 100% because if you slow it down, then you're just gonna overheat your loop. It's a partial truth because depending on the pump, depending on the pump strength, depending on the size of the AIO, depending on the CPU, depending on a million different factors, that may or may not be true. But in our instance here in testing this, I found 80% to actually be the sweet spot. And I tend to run my D5s usually right around 50%. So I learned something today by doing this test, which is the whole reason why I did it. And I just wanted to share with you guys the results. So if you want me to do this with a giant custom loop, maybe something like Goldmember, well, if it potentially is still here, uh, or I'll build a custom loop to do it myself where I can test that at both, like on D5 settings at zero, one, two, three, four, and five, and see what happens there. All right, guys, sound off down below. If you have tested this, what are your results? What kind of data have you seen? And where was the sweet spot for your particular system? Remember, as time goes on and these loops start to evaporate some coolant through them, which all AIOs will, it will actually become harder for the pump to continue to move fluid as more air makes its way into the system. So that's why AIOs that can also be topped off are very important when it comes to longevity. Because as I mentioned at the 100% fan speed, not only are we dealing, or excuse me, pump speed, not only are we also dealing with uh, max rating for the pump itself, accelerating wear and tear, we're also potentially causing cavitation, as I mentioned, which is why the temp might be slightly higher. And as air starts to make its way into the system, that would only accelerate cavitation and make it even harder for the pump to move fluid, which would cause premature failure. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you learned something today. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.